Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Esther once again. We are in Esther chapter 4 today. We have been working chapter by chapter through this series. It's hard to believe we're almost halfway through, um, but uh, today we find ourselves in Esther chapter 4. So once you locate that, I'll ask that you just join me briefly as we pray, and then we'll begin to look into God's Word together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. As the psalmist said, Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. That is our prayer that you would teach us. That you would enlighten us. And that, Father, we will be different from having sat this time under your word. Help us. Father, to understand, to sense your conviction, and to respond as you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood And looked at one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Those words are the opening stanza of a famous poem by Robert Frost. You may remember reading it in high school. The poem was entitled, The Road Not Taken. Robert Frost in that poem describes a moment of uncertainty. A moment in which he is hiking and the the single lane, the trail that he is on, all of a sudden splits. And instead of being shaped like a lowercase l, it looks like a capital Y. And he stands there at that crossroads. He stands there at that juncture trying to consider which path to take. And he finds himself perplexed and he's analyzing the two paths. He's analyzing the decision that is before him. And he finds himself, at least at first, somewhat uncertain about what to do. Of course, years later, Robert Frost's dilemma was solved by the great philosopher Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. That's easier said than done, I suppose. If only it were that easy to come to a fork in the road, ah, just take it. But sometimes we don't know which path to take, which is Robert Frost's point. He stood there in this dilemma, this moment of anxiety, not sure which way to go. And let's be honest, sometimes it's those forks in the road that are the most difficult moments in life, aren't they? Those moments when we find ourselves pulled in one direction, but also pulled in another direction. Should I let that person back into my life, or should I give it more time? Should I tell my grown adult children what they should do in this situation and give my advice, or should I just keep my mouth shut? We can all go, we've all gone through moments where we find ourselves at this crossroads, at this juncture where there's two different roads that we could take. And moments like these, they often leave us paralyzed, don't they? They leave us in this moment of fear, this moment of struggle and uncertainty not knowing what to do. As much as Robert Frost felt that uncertainty, and as much as really all of us have felt that uncertainty from time to time, how much more in chapter 4 does Queen Esther feel that uncertainty? 
Here in chapter 4, we find Queen Esther confronted with with a decision to make. And the the path before her, it diverges into two roads. And and there's this tug of war going on in Queen Esther's life. An internal tug of war, in some ways an external tug of war, where she's being pulled in one direction, pulled in the other. It's a moment of, of tears. It's a moment of fear. It's a moment of anxiety. But it is absolutely also a moment of destiny. A moment in which the providence of God has been working behind the scene. The providence of God has been preparing her for this exact instant. And what Esther learns in this chapter, what Mordecai learns in this chapter, and truly what we learn in this chapter, is that God even works amid life's uncertainty. Even in those moments when we don't know what to do, when we scratch our head, when we're confused, God is never confused. When we find ourselves in those moments of, 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 of a, a lack of clarity, we, we can trust the fact that God in His providence is still at work. And even though Esther's torn, even though Esther is, is again, initially confused, She's brought to a point to see how God has been working. We we learn in this chapter really just one truth about how to respond in uncertain times. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is give you the one truth, but in two halves. You know how the easiest way to eat an elephant is? Just one bite at a time, right? So I'm going to give you the first bite as we work through the chapter and then give you the, the second bite, all right? So one truth, when you find yourself in in uncertain times, torn about what to do, this is a truth that Esther learned that we can learn as well. First of all, we see in this chapter, chapter 4, that uncertain times require faith in God's promises. Uncertain times require faith in God's promises. Now, we have a long way to get to that point in this chapter. So let's start in verse 1, and we'll get to it. Chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done. Now, let's pause there for a moment. Some of you are visiting today. This is your first time here, and you don't know all that has been done. So let me get you caught up to speed. It's the year between four and 500 B.C. before Christ. We're in the Persian Empire. This is the superpower of the day, the the geopolitical bullies. These are the guys in charge, the Persians. The king of the empire is known as Xerxes, but in the book of Esther, he's called Ahasuerus. And in chapter 1, Ahasuerus decides to divorce his wife. In chapter 2, he decides to look for a new one. So he holds this ancient version of the bachelor and has all these virgins brought near. And they each have one night with the king, and based upon that, he chooses the new queen. There were 400 women that were brought to Ahasuerus, and one of those women was a Jew by the name of Esther, who was being raised by her uncle, or excuse me, her cousin, Mordecai. Now, chapter 2 concludes, Esther's crowned as queen, and everybody celebrates, and they're having a big, fun time. And then this weird event happens that seems so odd to the story, but it's really important, so I want to remind you of it. There was this assassination attempt against Ahasuerus. Mordecai, the cousin, finds out about it, tells Esther. Esther tells the king they understand what it is. The men are executed, and Mordecai gets a little footnote in the king's journal. It's seemingly random, but it's going to come back in the story. So we end that, and then chapter 3, Mordecai has risked his life. So it seems like Mordecai is the guy who's about to get promoted. If anybody deserves a reward in in the corner office, it's Mordecai. But chapter 3 opens, and it says, and then Ahasuerus promoted Haman, some other guy. And we learned last week there's this long family conflict between Haman's family and Mordecai's family, between the Israelites and the Amalekites. This has gone on for a long time, and so Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman. Haman takes it personally, and instead of just getting back at Mordecai, he decides to take out his vengeance against all of Mordecai's people. 
Think, think of Hammond, if you will, as the beta version of Adolf Hitler. He was the first guy to say, let's exterminate the Jews. And so he comes up with this plan, working with the Hashers that they're going to do this. And so this is where chapter 4 now picks up. Mordecai, it says, he learned about this plan, this extermination plan, this genocide plan. So it says in verse 1, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. All of a sudden, this this public announcement brings a public outcry. The, the, The Jews become distressed, and they start openly mourning and lamenting this plan of extermination. Now, what they do here is, it's not something we as Americans ever do, is it? I mean, one of the great American virtues is to never cry, right? Never show anybody that you're emotional. You've got to hold it all together. You've got to have a stiff upper lip. But you turn on the TV and, you know, the Middle East and in Asia, when there's something distressing, people will be in the streets and throwing dust in the air. There's this, 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 this open, outward lamenting of what's going on. And by the way, I I think we could probably learn something from that. We're we're too quick to suppress our emotions and and, and not to deal with things. What do we do as Americans? How are you today? Fine. How are you? I'm fine. And we walk off. And we're not fine. I mean, oftentimes we're going through difficult things and we act as if nothing's wrong. You say, well, I don't want to share my burdens. It doesn't Scripture say that we are to bear each other's burdens? You say, well, I don't, I don't want to share my emotions. I don't want to be, I'll, I'll be humiliated. Doesn't it say God gives grace to the humble? There are sometimes, men, it's okay to cry. It's okay to share our emotions. It's okay to have this outcry, this fasting, this weeping, this wailing that, that comes from this. And the Jews are distressed. So verse 4 says, Then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, And the queen writhed in great anguish. The Hebrew there is really interesting. There's this just this she this pain that it's almost like a physical pain that's so strong. She hears that her cousin's upset, and that makes her upset. You're going to see in a moment. She doesn't even know what the issue is. She just hears he's sad, and that makes her sad. So it says in verse four, and she sent garments to clothe the Mordecai that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Now that seems weird, right? He's standing outside the gates, crying and moaning, and she's like, "Hey, I got a new pair of skinny jeans for you. I bought it at Kohl's. You know, here you go, put these on. You know." Why, why is she sending him new clothes that seems bizarrely out of place? Well, the reason for this is verse 2. He couldn't come near the palace because he was wearing sackcloth and ashes. The palace had a dress code. And he had to be dressed in a certain way. So she wants to send him clothes to change so that he will then come into the palace and she can give him a big hug and he can cry on her shoulder and they can figure out what's going on. But he refuses because he wants to identify with the Jewish people. He wants to to be known for this struggle and this distress. So he he will not take the clothes. So verse 5, Then Esther summoned Hathak from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn, notice this, what this was and why it was. That is so interesting and telling. Do you see the unbelievable irony there? Mordecai, who's outside the palace, knows more about the king than Esther, who lives inside the palace. She's in the palace and doesn't even know what's going on. This is not a a match made in heaven that, you know, he comes home from work and puts his briefcase down and Esther's, you know, cooking fried chicken. How was your day, honey? He's like, oh, you know, the website went down today. And oh, yeah, we planned the genocide. Like, they're not not talking about that stuff, you know. She she doesn't know this is going on. She's, She's been left in complete isolation. She doesn't have a clue, and she just hears Mordecai sad, I'm sad, what's the deal here? And so they get this go-between, this guy Hathak, to, 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 
to take care of things. So verse 6, so Hathak went out to Mordecai to the city square in front of the king's gate. Now what's interesting is the rest of the chapter is just a discussion between Esther and Mordecai through this third party guy, Hathak. How would you like to be that guy? It's like, well, she said this. Well, you know, he said this. And like, he's just constantly going back and forth. The only reason we have this is because Hathak, you know, kept up with it. He knew what each person was saying and he related it one to the other. So verse 7, Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show Esther and inform her. Now stop there for a moment. Esther sends Hathak asking, what's wrong? Why are you upset? And, and Mordecai replies, because the king has issued this decree. This is not a test this is the real deal. If you don't believe me, here's, here's, you know, here's um, exhibit A, here's exhibit B, here's a copy of this, here's the amount of money. And he sends all the evidence with Hathak. And he's telling her, listen, you're in danger, I'm in danger, our people are in danger. This is serious business, Esther. Don't ignore this. Here's the details. Here's the fact. Something needs to be done. So it says in verse 8, he not only was saying this to inform her, but also to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Notice how Mordecai starts to apply a little pressure and encouragement to her. He says, you need to do something. You're in a position to talk to the king. And so he says here that you need to go plead with him for her, that is for your people. Now think about this. This is not just a crisis of decision. This is a crisis of identity for Esther. It's as if Mordecai is saying, hey, listen, Let's be clear about this. Yes, you might have been crowned Esther the Queen. You might have been honored as Esther the Queen. Every day you may be revered as Esther the Queen, but don't forget you were born Hadassah, the Jew. Don't forget your identity. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget that you're part of God's people. You have a role in this. Now think about it. This is the guy who up to this point has been telling her to hide it. But something's happening in Mordecai's heart. He begins to see his faith, if you will, begins to grow. And he begins to realize, hey, we, we, we're going to get exterminated. We've got to do something about this. And so he now begins to, to prod her in the right direction. Verse 9, Hathak came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. So here we go again. She says... All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death. Unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And she adds this, I have not been summoned to live, excuse me, to come to the king for these 30 days. Archaeologists have uncovered paintings and carvings from the Persian Empire that shows a picture of the throne, and there's the king on the throne, and behind him is a big guy with an axe. One, one commentator I heard, he said, um, this policy was wrong, but incredibly effective. <laughs> you did not interrupt the king. Didn't matter if you were his wife. Unless he asks for you, you don't come, and, and what's going to result is you're going to lose your head. And she knows this, and, and, and as any of us, she's, she's, she's afraid. So do you see the roads diverging here? Mordecai saying, you need to go talk to your husband. She says, but if I go talk to my husband, here's what's going to happen. She's now getting pulled in two different directions. She's, she's not sure initially what to do, and so she, she throws out, listen, I, I can't go talk to him. He hasn't even asked for me. He's been busy with the harem. I haven't even been around for a month. 
What makes you think he would talk to me now? And so Esther begins to be pulled between these two different directions. Verse 12, they related Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Now listen to this. Do not imagine that you are in the king's palace, excuse me, that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And we come to the most famous words of the book. For such a time as this. It's as if Mordecai says, okay, here's the situation. If you go before the king, you will likely die. If you don't go before the king, you will definitely die. That's your choice. And you are in a position as his wife. You are here in the palace at this time. Just coincidentally, believe it or not, you of all people, a Jew who's, who, who, who's shared the king's bed, you are in the position that you could do something about this. And he, he appeals to her that she has a, a task to do. He says you can't remain silent. Bonhoeffer once said that silence in the face of evil is evil. Something needs to be done, he says. And you're in a, a, a providential place to be able to do something about this. Now notice how he appeals to her. Look at verse 14. He says, for if you remain silent this time, notice relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. What Mordecai seems to be appealing to here, there's this... this literary device, if I can call it that, that happens throughout the Bible. Jesus uses it a lot. It's what we refer to as the divine passive. It's a way to talk about God without talking about God. You say something, and and the only logical conclusion is God. So when Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, um, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comforted by who? He doesn't answer the question, but he leads you to assume it's, it's God. When Jesus is asked by the disciples, who gets to sit on your right hand on, and on your left? And Jesus says, it's not mine to, it's not mine to give out, but those seats are, are for those for whom they have been prepared. Prepared by who? Well, the implication is, is God. He doesn't talk about God, but he's talking about God. And when Mordecai makes this statement here that, 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 that relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, it's as if he is appealing to, to their history and to what God has promised them. The whole history of Israel up to this point is one of relief and deliverance. I mean, think about it. They were in Egypt. Did God leave them there to flounder and to die in slavery? He raised up Moses to deliver them and give them relief. They came to the Red Sea. They should have perished. But what did God do? He saw to it that there was relief and deliverance. When they came into the Promised Land, they came up against the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Amorites and all those other ites. And guess what? Many times they should have perished. But guess what? He delivered them throughout the cycle of judges. They disobeyed God and yet He, time and time again, delivered them. When they came up against the Philistines there and, and, and David went out to fight Goliath, God once again delivered them. He, he's saying, look, our history is a history of deliverance and relief. And Esther, do, do you not see that God has made this promise? Again, he doesn't say it expressly, but it's as if he's appealing to what God told Abraham. In the very beginning, God told Abraham, Abraham, through you all the nations will be blessed. I'm going to make you a great nation. Those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. And God made a promise to Abraham to make them a great nation. And it's as if Mordecai is saying, and so God made this promise. Do you think that this one guy, Haman, is going to undo the promises of God? 
Is this one guy powerful enough to stop the promises of God that he's actually going to annihilate us? Mordecai says, no, 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 no. There, there is freedom, there is deliverance coming. God has, has done this in the past. He has promised this to us. And so you need to do something about it. You are in that place. Now, I want to point out something to you. This is what he's appealing to her. But I want you to go back and think about her response, her initial response. He says, you need to go talk to your husband, you need to go beg him, implore him, and now he says, because deliverance is coming one way or another, appealing to as if God has done this in the past, he's going to do it again, and and this is your opportunity. And she initially, notice this, she initially refuses because she is claiming some kind of omniscience. Now you tell me that we don't do this all the time. Where we know that we should do something, we should act in faith based on God's promises and based upon God's word, and we hear it and we know it and we know it's right, and yet we sit back here and we claim some kind of omniscience about tomorrow or the future, and and we use that to rationalize or justify our disobedience. Well, I can't go witness to that person because if I do, they're going to slam the door in my face. How do you know? Well, I can't give of my offering to the church because I won't be able to pay my bills at the end of the month. When did you get a crystal ball? You see, we claim this omniscience, don't we? We talk ourselves out of obedience because it requires faith. And we don't like that. We like everything to be sight. But that's exactly the antithesis of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take God's word and God's promises and, and, and live by faith and not by sight. What is faith? It is the conviction of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you need to see it, you're not acting in faith. Faith says, I don't see it, but I trust that God's word is more reliable than what I see with my eyes and hear with my ears, so I'm going to obey God's promises and God's word despite the outcome. I'm pretty sure that everybody up to the time of Daniel that was thrown in a lion's den was mauled to death. And Daniel could have easily been like, well, given what happens... And talked himself out of obedience. Because guess what? It requires faith. And faith is saying, Lord, I I don't, I don't know, I don't understand, but I know your word is truth, and I know your word is right, and so I'm going to, to, based upon your word, I'm going to follow your promises. You see, it's at moments like this when we talk ourselves out of acting in faith, doing something in faith, it's moments like this, now you listen to me closely, moments like this when instead of worshiping Christ, what we are worshiping is comfort. Moments like that, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to set myself to be vulnerable. I don't want to do something that's so risky. Well, 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 guess what? When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he didn't promise it would be comfortable. And sometimes, acting in faith, even in those uncertain moments, it's to say, God, your word is, is reliable. Your word is trustworthy. I'm going to follow your word. In other words, here's what Mordecai is saying here. Esther, stop leaning on your own understanding and trust the Lord with all your heart isn't that hard sometimes but that's the call of scripture and and what we see here in this exchange is that in in these uncertain times they require faith in god's promises i don't know if i should forgive that person i don't know if i should call that person i don't know if i should 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 do this i don't know if i should do that I, i don't know how to Take God's word at face value and say, Lord, in faith, I'm going to obey your word, even though I fear the outcome. Because Esther is still afraid. This law doesn't get erased all of a sudden. 
She still knows what's coming and she says, yet, even in my uncertainty, I'm going to take God's word and I'm going to obey it. Are we worshiping Christ or are we worshiping comfort? Faith can be very uncomfortable sometimes. But it's right. It's right. So in uncertain times, they require faith in God's promises. Now, we're not done. Uncertain times require faith in God's promise. That's what Mordecai is telling Esther. It requires faith in God's promises. And number two, faith in God's promises requires action. Faith in God's promises requires action. He gets done pleading with her and saying, you are here for such a time as this. Now, look in your Bible real closely, all right? My, my verse 14 ends with a question mark and a closed quotation marks. Beneath that's a little header, Esther plans to intercede. Then verse 15, I have a 1-5, and it says, then Esther. Okay. If you back up just in between those two, you see that little white space in your Bible there? That's where Esther repents of her unbelief. Because up to this point, she doesn't want to do it. But Mordecai says, God, is this not God's track record? Is this not what God, is not God going to do what he says? And so up to this point, she's like, oh, it's going to be uncomfortable. I want to do this. I'm going to set myself up. And now, verse 15, then Esther told them to reply. Faith is now in the driver's seat. Verse 16, go, she says, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. And then here is the clincher. And thus I will go into the king. You see, see, faith is an internal conviction that produces an external action. An internal conviction that leads to an external action. It's a belief that that then brings about certain behavior. And so Esther, she she receives what Mordecai says. And and again, the law hasn't changed between verse 14 and 15. She knows what she's risking here. But she also understands that, that God and His providence has her here. He's been working behind the scene to bring this about. And so she says it with a very declarative statement of resolve, and thus I will go into the King. Is she still at risk? Yes. Is she still risking her life? Is it still possible she might die? Yes. Is she still vulnerable? Yes, all of this is true. None of this has changed, except she is now acting in faith in the face of this opposition. It isn't, okay, Mordecai, I believe you, I believe you, and I have faith, and that's it. It's, I believe you, now I'm going to make plans. Now I'm going to make steps. Now I'm going to, there's going to be actions that accompany what I believe. So start fasting. Don't eat or drink for three days. And, 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 and the idea here is pray for me. This is not a foolhardy like, okay, I'm going to go talk to the king. It's like we need to, we need to pray. We, God has brought us here. We need God to grant us success in this. And so they come, and and, and on her behalf, they intercede on her behalf so that she will be successful when she then goes into the king. My friends, faith, it requires action. What what did James say? Finish the sentence for me, okay? Faith without works is dead. dead. It's dead. But how many times do we say, well, I, I believe that and I, 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 I absolutely, you know, I, I totally believe that. But our actions, they betray that. Let me give you a math problem. Not like a math problem, uh, like an equation, okay? Some of you are taking notes, write this down, okay? Others of you, stick it in your brain. Are you ready? Here's a math problem. This will help you out a great deal, all right? It's not really math, but it's sort of like math, all right? Write down the words stated Beliefs. Stated beliefs. And underneath that put a a line, like a division line. 
So you take your stated beliefs and you divide them by your actual practice. So stated beliefs divided by, then write underneath that actual practice, and then put an equal sign, stated beliefs divided by actual practice equals actual beliefs. Did you catch it? So stated beliefs, I believe God is sovereign, I believe God is powerful. That's the belief that you state. But then you divide that by your actual practice, and here's a man and woman who doesn't pray. What is prayer? Prayer is saying, God's sovereign and I'm not. It's out of my hands, I'm looking to God. The man says, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but he never prays. And so his actual belief is, he doesn't really believe God is sovereign. Because faith will produce works, it will produce action in us. And, and Esther embraces it. She says, yes, I believe. And now her actual practice is making steps in that direction. And so we have to examine ourselves at every juncture and see that's the case. Do you remember um, um, Hebrews chapter 11? It's the most faith-filled chapter in the Bible, right? My dad used to always call it the hall of faith. So all these people are recognized in Hebrews chapter 11 for faith, Right? By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Now listen to me closely. That chapter is filled with faith. But that chapter, if you look closely, is also filled with action verbs. By faith, Abraham trusted. By faith, Abraham sacrificed Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith, Moses' parents hid him. There's action. By faith, Moses refused to be called Pharaoh's son, or the Pharaoh's daughter's son. By faith, Rahab welcomed the spies. How do you know they had faith? It was all these action verbs. It wasn't just, well, I believe it, sort of. No, it it produced something in them. And that's what Esther is doing. Here we see that, that faith in God's promises, it requires action. He concludes there in verse 16. She says, And thus I will go into the king which is not according to the law. This is the first, uh, one of the earliest references of civil disobedience. The law hasn't changed. She knows what's at stake. But she says, I'm, there is a law higher than the Persian law, and that is the law of God. And I'm going to go before him, even though it's unlawful. And then notice the statement at the end of verse 16, and if I perish, I perish. She doesn't say, I'll only do this if it's comfortable. No, in faith, I'm going to do what's right. And even if it's uncomfortable, even if it means my own demise, this is not about self-preservation. This is about self-denial. And if I perish, I perish. And so Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded. Esther finds herself in this moment of uncertainty. This moment pulled in these two different directions and she at first is is very, she struggles about what to do and she finds herself pulled in these two directions. The the, the supreme example of this that we find in Scripture of this kind of struggle and toil was not in the life of Esther, it was in the life of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember when two roads diverge in the Garden of Gethsemane? There he began to pray and he began to sweat great drops of blood. And there, in that moment of of anxiety and stress, the Lord Jesus himself prays, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He's at that crossroads and yet he concludes, Not my will, but yours be done. He comes to that moment and and realizes, and and, and of course Christ acts in obedience to the will of the Father, and, and so he comes to this point. And unlike Esther who simply said, if I perish, I perish, Jesus stood up in that garden and said, when I perish, I perish. Peter, put your sword away. The time has come for me to die. 
And he gave himself and he came to that cross and it was at the right time. Even as Esther, it says, maybe it's for such a time as this. What is it that Scripture says, Galatians 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. If I can borrow the language of, 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 of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the truer and better Esther. What is it that Mordecai is saying? He's saying, Esther, God sent you into the palace. Not to ignore the Jews, but that through you the Jews might be saved. And the promise of John 3.17, God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. He does exactly what she does in a greater measure and lays down his life as he himself said, greater love has no man than this than he laid down his life for his friends. That's what Esther is willing to do. And my friend, ultimately, that is what Jesus has done for all of us. And Jesus says, not simply if I perish, I perish. He says, when I perish, I perish. And you know why he perished? So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Esther risked her life. She was willing to lay it down to see to the, to, to the re- relief, to the deliverance of the Jews. And Jesus has come and laid down his life, not just for the Jews, but for God so loved the world. And has laid down his life to purchase our part in our redemption. My friend, if you're here and you don't know Christ, that is the first step of faith that you need to make. To put your faith and your trust in Jesus, to repent of your sins and to follow Him. And that's not just sitting here saying, well, I believe that Jesus lived and I believe that Jesus did some things. Again, it's not about just an intellectual knowledge. Faith without works is dead. To have faith in, in, in the gospel, to have faith in Christ, is, is, is to then produce the repentance and, and the following of Christ that only God can bring about in us. Robert Frost, at the end of that poem, he said, I took the road less traveled. And he concluded... And in the end, it made all the difference. Esther is embarking on the road less traveled. Christ certainly embarked on the road less traveled. And we are called to do the same. To deny ourselves, to live in faith, and to allow our faith to bring about the obedience to God's word and God's promises. You can trust him. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this reminder from Esther chapter 4 of the importance of faith in our lives. And Lord, we sit here today in a world surrounded by people who live simply by what they can see and touch and measure and weigh. And yet, God, we are reminded that we are men and women who live by faith. And Lord, that's a challenge in our world sometimes. It's hard for us to do. It it, it scares us. It, it, It causes us to be anxious. It causes us to be hesitant. But oh Lord, I pray that in this room right now, you will fill our hearts with renewed zeal, with renewed courage, the courage of Esther to do what's right regardless of the outcome. To say your word and your promises are worth it. Father, we thank you for your providence that you work even amid life's uncertainties, that your plan is is working in us. Father, produce that action in us. For some, that may be church membership. For others, it may be baptism. For others, it may be a phone call. Produce, Lord, in us what only you can do. For your glory and your honor, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.